everyone. This is the All Atlantic Talks podcast. My name is Mariana, and I'm a former All Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador. The All Atlantic Talks podcast fosters the engagement of stakeholders, joint pilot actions, and youth ambassadors of the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance. This podcast is coordinated by the Brazilian National Council of State Funding Agencies and is under the Anchor Project, which is supported by the European Commission. As global awareness of climate change deepens, new dialogues are emerging, driven by an urgent desire to safeguard the ocean and its delicate ecosystems. This conversation is especially important across generations. We are all dealing with the challenge of making appropriate decisions to inspire change, drive policy shifts, and ensure a sustainable future for the ocean and the planet. So today, I'm very happy to introduce our guests for one more episode of the Intergenerational Dialogue series. I would like to welcome Com Denishaw. Welcome. Thank you, Mariana. Thanks for having me as well. It was very exciting to join the podcast following the meeting some of you guys in person at the Galway Statement. So my name is uh, Com Denishaw. I'm originally French, but I've been living and working in Norway for the past six years. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the Institute of Marine Research, working quite closely on the North East Atlantic fisheries, especially the North Sea, working especially on Atlantic cod, and a lot of work on otolith and archival reconstructions. So I've done a lot of work on climate change and kind of century scale changes in growth and maturity in the face of climate change and fishing pressure. That's super important and super nice. Thank you for sharing. Also, I would like to welcome Katriona Reed. Welcome, Katriona. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Katrina. I am originally half Romanian, half Scottish, but I've lived in Ireland for most of my life. So I'm kind of from all over the place. I never know where to say where I'm from, um, but I'm based in Cork. In, I'm a student in UCC and I'm working in the Maori Centre down in Ringeskidi at the moment. And I did my undergraduate in UCC in political science and during that undergraduate, I very much went into it with a stronger interest in the politics side of things, but then that developed into more of a research interest in climate change and biodiversity and all these things. So then I went to the Galway Statement Conference about two months ago, and it was fantastic to meet everyone in person. And it was such a welcoming and warm introduction to this space. So I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And thank you for sharing a little bit of your experience and a little bit of your background. And also, I would like to introduce Kahal Gavin. Welcome, Kahal. Thanks, Marianne, for inviting us on today. So, yeah, my name is Kahal. I'm from Ireland. I'm working down here in the Mara Centre attached to the University College of Cork. And my primary roles are in kind of areas of stakeholder engagement, uh, facilitation of research exchange, as well as technical support for different GIS tasks with the European Space Agency. So, I've kind of a finger in many pies, you could say. Thank you very much. To start our conversation, could you tell us a little bit about your work on the ocean climate interface? I have to preface this by saying that it's interesting that both at the Galway Statement, when we have this uh, youth group uh, work on climate change, but also now the podcast, I'm very happy to see that as three speakers and everyone has a different angle. So there's like stakeholder involvement and then more politics involvement and then I'm more on the science kind of hard science side of things on the ecosystem which is very interesting and provided me with a very high uh, diversity of point of views during the global statement um so as, as part of my own work as I said I'm way more into the ecosystem effects of climate change and especially in the ocean living and working in Norway and especially in the northeast Atlantic I worked firsthand with the effect of climate change on fish populations during my PhD I did my thesis on the Barents Sea, which is the Arctic Sea between Svalbard and Norway. And the Barents Sea is currently one of the fastest warming areas of the world. So it's one that is actively being transformed by climate change and in which the ecosystems are changing very fast, which gives us on one hand a great opportunity to study them and see how they change in real time. But also on the other hand, it's very scary because they change incredibly fast and some sustainable fisheries and population might suddenly collapse because everything is just getting atlantified very fast. So personally, I've been very involved in that uh, issue of climate change on the oceans and especially in the subarctic areas. I've done a lot of work on uh, long-term reconstructions of fish biology using especially otolith. So otolith, for those not aware, is uh, fish ear stones. Uh, and those ear stones can record in a way kind of like the black box of the fish. So they, they can record uh, in real time, everything happening in the fish life. So you can see the yearly growth rings and you can measure these growth rings. 
And then by applying different models, you can look into these growth changes at the population level and see how they reacted to different environmental forces, such as temperature uh, or salinity or hydrology, and also at uh, how they react to human changes like fishery pressure. And part of my thesis a few years ago was to develop uh, almost century long chronology of the Atlantic cod biology in the Barents Sea. Uh, using a very strong archival database. So I used about 5,000 individual fish uh, scattered between 1930 and now. And I looked into how their growth change and their maturity change uh, over the span of the century. And one thing that was very interesting and very visible was that already from the get-go, as soon as the 70s hit up and we have this kind of little ice, ice age in the ocean, suddenly the temperatures pick up and just never stop going up again. And this has transformed profoundly the ecosystem and especially the cod population in the Barren Sea. We see that coupled with also the high fishing mortality, fish there is growing much faster and is also maturing much earlier than it was the case just 50 years ago. And now in the last 20 years, this uh, warming and acclimatification of the Barren Sea has increased even more. So now a big part of my research currently is to kind of monitor in real time what's happening and trying to apply different approaches to look into how fish might be moving uh, forward, especially. So how fish from the North Sea are slightly extending to the Norwegian Sea, and then the Norwegian Sea is also extending to the Barents Sea because the Barents Sea is being transformed gradually from a subarctic ecosystem to a more Atlantic ecosystem because of this warming. So yeah. So that was very relevant for me to, to take part in this Galway statement discussion. And especially this group in particular was very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing about your research. It's very, very interesting. And it's very important, as you said, that we can connect our different points of view of how to analyze and how to face uh, the climate change effects in the ecosystems, in the politics, in the case of marine resources, you were saying about fishes and fish stocks and how this also influence our economies, our ocean frontiers that we, we cannot see, but they are there. And then everything is changing and everything is so delicate, especially uh, very close to the Arctic. Thank you for sharing again. Katrina, would you like to tell us a little bit about, about your work? Thank you so much. Firstly, just to like reflect what Colm said at the beginning there about all the different perspectives your politics, your science, your hard facts, everything. It's just, it's so important for us all to come together because everyone has something different to say. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, yes, yeah, so in my own work, I'm very much focused on youth engagement in biodiversity. And while I've been here at the Maori Centre, I've been um, developing a set of education resources for teachers and educators to use in classrooms and in other educational settings to teach um, children between the ages of about maybe five to six years old or so, all the way up until 17, 18. So basically like resources for primary school and secondary school, as we refer to them in Ireland. And these resources are all about improving educational outcomes on biodiversity, improving awareness, and also improving their debating skills and their kind of critical thinking skills around the climate and around biodiversity. Um, there is definitely a bit of a marine element to it. One of the resources has to do with a debate about the nature restoration law from the EU, and that is obviously a big marine element to it. That's been really rewarding work to do, and I'm really, really enjoying it. And this project I'm on right now is called Tribe, and it was a legacy from the Children and Young Persons Assembly on Biodiversity Loss, which was held almost exactly a year ago in Ireland. And this assembly brought together 35 randomly selected children from around the country to discuss biodiversity and make recommendations to government and this kind of assembly this kind of citizens assembly model is something that I had the pleasure of studying in great depth um, when I was doing my undergrad and it's a model that Ireland has been working on for a few years now to really kind of get down get perfect this is something that Ireland is really paving the way forward in doing and it's really important work so I'd say general theme in my kind of work so far has been youth engagement my dissertation, I did that on youth engagement with climate messaging. Um, I wanted to investigate which climate messages were most, uh, what's the word, attractive, the most palatable to young people. So I worked with people around my age, around between 20 and 24 years old. And I basically asked them, which messages about climate do you find the most interesting, the most appealing, which messages kind of get you going or get you active? That's basically me. 
that's very inspiring and very challenging as well. Having this work to inspiring the next generation, the ones that will make decisions in the future, the ones that will be able maybe to engage their communities and other people and climate change may be tough to include in our daily conversations. And these educational and very empathetic way to include, to make children and the young generation part of the conversation and to listen and to adapting the messages according to what they are thinking about it. How are they feeling this kind of changes? Because they are born already in a timeline of very, very drastic changes. And that's very nice. Thank you very much for sharing in Kahal. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your work? My work kind of it kind of has two different hats between being GIS tech focused, but also with stakeholder engagement and that kind of thing. So my main project is a project called Doors. It's based on the Black Sea. It's a development and it's a development program for the Black Sea region. My group's main focus is on capacity building. It's basically a program for young professionals from across Europe and especially the Black Sea region to be placed in institutes so they can go to these places with a project ideas or to collaborate with mentors to increase their skill sets so they can build still collaborative networks and bring them back to their home countries. And hopefully we want to try and encourage more Europe-wide collaborative activity. And my more tech-focused stuff is on GIS support, especially for the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So I have the very great privilege to see all these fascinating data sets and see over time, like I'm, I'm given a lot of wide time frame data sets to look at. So I get to see them, I get to see the changes happening, especially over the um, Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets and um, some chlorophyll uh, concentration data. So it's, it's a lot of very broad, interesting stuff. Both hats are very much important jobs to do. And what you're saying about tech, the GIS, and how to make information visible. You said you're seeing the changes and that's very powerful to influence decision makers and also to make them aware of what's going on. And also the capacity building, that's fantastic to be able to manage people and make them part of the process as well. And thank you very much. And considering the challenge of the ongoing climate change crisis in 2023, which is absolutely alarming and scary, how can international collaborations and agreements facilitate the advancement of outcome-oriented approaches to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change? I guess that's a great question. And that's probably one question that if we had a definitive answer to, we might be finally able to tackle climate change properly. Uh, how to actually use international collaboration agreements to have outcome-oriented approaches. That's the kind of holy grail of international collaboration, still in the progress. Yeah, so for me, I think one of the things that really is one concept I've, I've had in mind since I started in, in this path of academic research and climate change and all of that is uh, a book I read quite a few years ago. Uh, called Shifting Baselines, Past, Present, and Future of the Fisheries. It's a very nice book uh, describing the shifting baseline syndrome in the context of fisheries. And it has a quote at the at the beginning from Carl Safina, you know, the great tree of life uh, contain all of our future options. And we've been handed the tree of life that is pruned and truncated, and we must not hand the next generation a bush. And to further prevent destruction, we should need the, both the science and the orienting power of history. And I really like that quote because one thing for me that is essential at the heart of every single international collaboration, especially if we want to have proper outcomes, is to know what we're actually trying to protect, what we're trying to mitigate and how to do it. You can't protect what you don't know. And as such, you need these international collaboration. You need these kind of global approaches to actually understand the ecosystems we need to protect as much as possible. Because if you don't know what you're protecting, you just might realize a few years down the line that actually you fail to protect something that was drastically important to uh, the overall ecosystem. And then that is gone now and you just can't go back. And the shifting baseline syndrome is especially important because by definition, it's a generational syndrome, meaning that every single generation of scientists starts its career. And I, I say scientists, I mean everyone. It's not only for scientists, it applies as well for politicians and really any person. But Everyone starts their life at a given time. So our notion of what is normality in terms of nature and climate and stuff like that 
is dependent on the context of when we were born. So someone born in a very depleted, very impacted area, or just generally condition of the world like it is currently now, might have kind of not really straight perception of what is pristine ecosystem, for example, and how you protect it. And as such, not only the science will be different, but also the policies we adapt from those science will be different. So let's take a practical example. If we want to protect a marine area, because we figure out that this marine area has value and maybe it's being overexploited or it's highly impacted by cyclones or whatever. So we want to, to put some proper protections on it and then just leave it to heal away from human activities. If the end goal of that policy, which maybe involves three, four different countries, is to go back to the initial state of the nature reserve and then see how the ecosystem thrives after 10 or 15 years of protection. Well, if that nature reserve was put in place now in 2023, the actual goal would be very different from if it was put in place in the 50s because the state it was now at the beginning is way worse than it was in the 50s. So there is this really important aspect that you need to know what you're going to protect and you really need to tackle at the international level, the understanding you need to have of those ecosystems. So for me, yeah, what, one of the key aspects of these international collaboration agreements is really to have as global a view as possible to really know how to set targets, to really know what is realistic as a target and also how to go there. That's a long winded answer. I will start like that. <laughs> Well, that's a great answer and a fantastic analysis and also a very nice way to see the things and, and to understand how important it is to share data and to have this global view, as you're just saying. Now, I think we are pressured to make decisions very fast based on what we are facing. And of course, that's very, very important, but also how important is the international collaborations that provide us some insights about making decisions and projecting things for the future to be able to protect the next generations and also the ecosystems at long term. Thank you very much. That's a very nice analysis. My biggest takeaway from, from Galway, using that as an example, was facilitation of, of dialogues and open exchange of ideas and creation of you know networks and bringing people together from all around the world in a room is a really magical thing to happen. I, I don't use the word magic lightly there, like it truly felt... There was this electricity in the room that I just had never experienced before. I don't think I will again for some time because it, there was just this, the sense that like we're all here with this common purpose. We all really ambitious and we want to try to get there as fast and as best as we can. So I think that there's a real, a real magic to be found in that action of bringing people together in the same room. Of course, there is a lot to be said for online but there's so much that you miss with the online experience that you can't replicate with these dialogues and with this open exchange and everything you learn about the problems that other people in other countries are facing and um, getting that chance getting that opportunity to talk to your neighbor across the ocean or your neighbor like right next to you is really important the Atlantic Ocean is so big and it's shared by so many countries that bring us all together. It's the key way, I think, to move forward. And by doing that, by talking to your neighbour, compassion is probably the best thing that you get out of that at the end. You get ideas and you get solutions and you understand their problems and that's brilliant. And then you gain this compassion for their perspective, for their struggles. That's, I think, probably the best thing that we can do moving forward is just have a bit more compassion, have a bit more understanding. We're living in the same planet and experiencing the same problems, but we are not in the same boat. We have different opportunities and different challenges based on the conditions that we are living in as a society, as a community, as a, a nation, a country, and as part of the Atlantic region. And these are very different scales to see this problem. And of course, we don't have the same opportunities as all of our neighbors. And that you have this compassion to listen to, to be open to share and to learn and to value every experience and every knowledge is very, very much important as well to understand climate change and how can we uh, have solutions to this problem, I believe. And this is the power of international collaboration. And thank you very much. I helped out on called Proto Atlantic, and it's essentially an innovation platform development program. So it helps people from across the Atlantic coast, especially in Europe, I think it was, 
to come together and form a communication network so that professionals in France or in Gran Canaria, they can interface with one another and test, test their innovations and then test their products they're, they're coming up with. So it was, it was a very interesting project that people in certain areas, they didn't see as much the possibility for collaboration as you might expect. So I'll say people who say like, there's a great platform for testing ocean technology, I think in Gran Canaria. And there were some partners present where they they were asked, do you guys know where your nearest test center is? So we have one here in Cork as well, for example, we have our nearest center and they didn't really know. So it was like, it was very interesting, very cool to see those those people communicating and building new connections. Yeah, so building the international collaboration agreements, if we can get those on a wider scale, especially developing that kind of platform further across the Atlantic could be very interesting to see. But then at the same time, you need to get countries that don't interface with ocean environments to see it. One of the biggest things that probably stops agreements or stops collaborations is that people don't know what they don't see. It's a pretty common adage that goes back to most of politics. And I think it still does, it still is relevant within the ocean climate. Uh, for what I do in the DOORS project, it's quite useful for people to see what the Black Sea is going through. What people in Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Turkey, Georgia, what they all experience dealing with the particular troubles of the Black Sea, especially things like eutrophication, pollution, all that kind of thing. So it's good to expose people to see problems so they know how to create agreements to facilitate outcome-oriented approaches in that kind of way, if you get what I mean. And that's the very thing that I think is very tricky about the ocean. We cannot see the impacts so easily on the deep sea, the current changes in temperature. We can see the corals bleaching. We can see erosion on our beaches, but it's very difficult to touch the change and the impact. And I think that's, that makes it so difficult to influence and to raise awareness about the impacts of climate change in the ocean. You were saying about having a communication network. I think that's one of the solutions or one thing that can help with solutions of people knowing what's going on. They all have this perception of change, but maybe they don't talk about it. Maybe they don't know how to recognize that. And the communication network and the international approach and collaboration maybe can help with that. As you all are early career researchers and early career professionals, how do you think you can contribute, you and the community of early career researchers and, and professionals, how do you contribute to catalyzing policy change in this collaborative effort that we just discussed uh, to foster climate resilience? How do you see your role in this narrative? For me, it, it boils down to not what we're doing now, but what we're going to do in the future, in a way. So policy makers tend to be on the higher end <laughs> of the age spectrum, to say so. Um, and the older you are, of course, that's not an absolute rule, but I would say on average, the more likely you, you are to have your views already kind of settled, you know, your understanding of things, of processes, of outcomes, of risk, of the necessity of taking maybe hard choices to protect these ecosystems and by default also to protect the human lives because the climate crisis is not just an nature crisis is directly impacting us and we'll be the one suffering from it way before the ecosystems of the whole world are suffering from it and i think although as i said it's not a it's not a hard rule it is harder to change someone's opinion especially if that someone has grown up and has lived most of his life in a context where all of those climate issues were not as prevalent and they were not as pushed on it's harder to change those guys opinion to make something happen than it is to simply have a generational shift in the policymakers. And I think the present days early career scientists and the present days younger people who one day will be, you know, 20 years older than they are, and they will be the ones taking hard decisions and they will be the one in position of making change. I think this is the best way that the early career people are going to actually affect the world. And I don't mean by that, that it's completely hopeless and nothing is going to happen in the next 10 years because plenty of things is already happening. And I think we're on the right track, but I think at the global level and in terms of how much of an emergency the climate crisis might be, I think there's really not a large hope to have proper strong changes in place in the next five years, but it is way more believable to say that maybe in 15 to 20 years, when there will be a huge generation shift in most of the country's uh, governments and stuff like that, 
I think that will be the best way that those changes will crystallize and we'll finally see these collaborative efforts. Because currently there is a, an international understanding of what's happening. There's an international understanding of how high the risk is and how we need to act. There are a lot of prominent voices throughout the world. There is a lot of prominent early career voices throughout the world. But a consistent theme is that a lot of those people might lack not legibility, but they might lack representativity in the actual bodies of politics and of the fields that are actually making those decisions. So currently we are being heard and that's it. But in maybe a decade or more, or also, I don't know exactly when, but there will come a time when a lot of those voices will turn into people in places of decision and places of power. And those people will finally be able to not just be heard, but actually talk and make stuff happen. And I think for me, this is the one glimmer of hope. I tend to have a bit of a darker outlook on climate crisis overall. And that was a recurring theme during the... Uh, climate session at the, the Galway Statement, which uh, for me, I also learned a lot because I learned to also have a more positive, brighter outlook on a lot of those issues. It was very interesting to learn from everyone. But yeah, I, I really currently think that the new generations are the future. They are the future policymakers. They are the future decision takers. The more international understanding we have, the more international collaboration we have, the easier it will be to, as you ask, catalyze those policy changes and make them an international issue and not just a national issue, because it's, it's just stuff won't happen in the, the time frame we need it to happen. If it's always on the country specific basis, it needs to be international. It needs to be global. And currently the early career generation is the generation that has this global understanding of those problems and how to act on it. I agree with you. It is not easy to have a positive way of looking and understanding this climate challenge. And sometimes it doesn't seem like we are going to have a solution in a very quick timeline. But I have hope, as you said, you also have it for the next years that we can improve and, and pressure to be at the table to influence because we are researchers or ocean professionals or early career professionals. We have something to say. We have value to add to the conversation. I hope we can see those changes earlier than we think we will. I think getting the conversation started is the place to begin for catalyzing change. Because how do you know what change you want to make unless you talk to other people who have similar ideas and similar ambition? But it's about coming together and you drive with that ambition in the right direction and in the best possible direction that will get us there the fastest. Because that's obviously we're running against a clock here that, again, we don't want to get too dark. But sometimes I go to that place too and it's kind of scary. But we need to kind of keep our eyes on the ball, if that makes sense. Keep focusing on, on the goal. And um, the best way, I think, to do that is meeting in person and about the magic of conferences. But it's about once the conference is over, once you've checked out of your hotel room and you're on the train or the, the bus home or whatever it is, keeping in touch and keeping your network there and making that connection, but keeping it going forward. Don't lose touch with the friends that you make at these conferences and um, keep them on social media, keep their number, whatever it might be. And then you might meet them again down the line and then you might find something you have in common. Maybe even maybe when you first meet, you might not have something in common. You might not have anything to, to work together on or talk about or anything like that. But down the line, you might. So it's important not to lose touch with these people, I think. The other thing as well is having a fresh perspective on the issue. Like there's already generations before us who've tried to tackle the climate crisis and they've done fantastic work. But there's still so much more to be done and we need to really be speeding up now. Sometimes when you're stuck, say on a crossword or on a puzzle or whatever, you might be stuck on something for, you know, hours and hours and then you hand it to your friend and you say, here, I can't solve this, you do it for me. And then your friend immediately finds a solution. And it's just because they haven't seen it before, but you've been stuck in the weeds with it. Then your friend has a fresh pair of eyes. So I think that kind of analogy, that's how I look at the world of young people is the fact that we're so new to the conversation and that's really valuable. And the fact that we can look at these problems and perhaps we can see solutions that other people haven't seen before us. Like one thing I like to ask people who have been working in this area for you know, decades longer than I have. What really drives you and what first got you interested in the climate and in the climate crisis? That's one thing that I think the more often you kind of go back to that, then you find what drove you at the beginning and you find what's keeping you going. 
in those darker moments when perhaps you you want to just pack it in and go pick a different career or you want to it's important to focus back on what brought you here in the first place when i have this kind of conversation i always end up thinking that it's all about people people connecting to themselves being together to support each other to help us thrive in our solutions and i think we as a younger generation we are much more aware of these issues of fairness and purpose and how these all are connected with the discussion about climate change about ocean literacy about global changes and it's about people it's about justice it is about having conversations and be able to be empathetic with the diversity of situations contexts thank you very much for sharing it's also very also very important to keep an eye on problems with communication information I'd argue that young people have quite a unique position in all this because we've grown up, we, especially to those who've gone through with education on this, we know a lot of the perspectives. We've studied them to some extent or another. So we know what's, what's been driving people. We probably have a unique position for our ability to communicate with people who've come before us who might not be as movable at certain topics. But we also have information that's coming out now. In my experience, anyway, young people are a lot more receptive to newer information that's coming down, um, maybe a bit more enthusiastic to act. Maybe disinformation or misinformation that might be coming down about different aspects of the climate. How do we take existing knowledge, existing experience, existing expertise and tie it together with what's coming out in the most recent scientific excursions? And then how do we collaborate them into a new ocean politic that we can move forward as young people we can all more or less understand these things bring them forward to our fellow young people and then as you guys have alluded to move forward into the future of bringing these ideas to the next generation but also in the now not just waiting for them try and appeal to the older sources of knowledge the older people who've come before us, who've paved this path for us, or who might be people in public service, people like politicians who might be as movable, bring them forward like, this is what the young people are. This is your voting block you need to appeal to moving forward in your elections. This is what we know. This is what we're interested in. This is topics that are being for us. We have this knowledge. You shouldn't listen to these people talking about this and hear the reasons why. We can't just go forward and say, listen to us because we're young. We say, like, listen to us because we have this evidence and this is why those people are wrong. And that kind of that kind of approach might be in a way more appealing and it might help catalyze that that policy change. Can bring those knowledge groups together if you get very much agree with what you said about we also have valuable evidence to enter the conversation and to be part of the decisions and to contribute in order to reach change. I could spend the whole day talking to you. You're very, very much kind and very much inspiring. And this episode will be even longer than usual because it was fantastic. I learned a lot. I believe our audience as well. I would like to invite you just to say a final message and then we can wrap up. Thanks for having me and, and everyone for this podcast. That was very interesting to uh, continue the discussion further out of the Go With segment. And yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting topic and it's very nice to get a, a diversity of point of views as well from uh, Katriona and Kapal with very different backgrounds as well. And I mean, during the Go With segment, it was also very interesting because the climate subgroup was uh, mostly made out of people working in not directly biology, so everything else. So there was a lot of people working with stakeholders and politics and there were people that were working on very different fields. There were a bit of physical oceanography, but it was not dominated by the typical crowd that I would see when I travel to, to my conferences on climate change and stuff like that. It's, it's mostly biologists or ecologists and stuff like that. So it's, it's a very one-sided dialogue because everyone is in agreement and bringing that diversity of actors and bringing that diversity of speakers suddenly to the group was very interesting because I could hear from people that had very different expectations of what the climate change crisis was to them, how some of their points echoed mine and some of my points eco bears. So yeah, I, I would say my uh, final probably plea toward all scientists of the world, not just uh, early career scientists, going toward the future of research and the future of climate change mitigation. I think transdisciplinarity is the key. We have to. Uh, we can't anymore just be a highly specialized biologist and kind of try to make stuff happen by having other people just 
glue themselves to the projects and make this uh, multi-headed monster of a policy uh, because the heads have to talk to each other. And I think everyone needs to have this more transdisciplinarity approach to any kind of project, any kind of policy change. You need to have the hard science looking at stuff. You need to have the human aspect included. You need to have the economic aspect. You need to have the social aspect. Uh, you need to have, you know, a proper understanding of uh, given mitigation might do something very profitable to the, the environment, uh, but might also have a very drastic negative effect on the human communities that are associated with this ecosystem. This is especially a big problem with any kind of work done on the global south, because the global south is traditionally, sadly, more impacted by current climate change than the Western world is. Uh, but it is also the one area of the world that policies and stuff might be harder to put in place because a lot of livelihood and a lot of socioeconomic aspects are even more entangled with the current environment. And I think this is something that traditionally old school science has maybe at times ignored or just not been aware of, which would be kind of, you know, noticing an environment or an ecosystem is collapsing or is a bad shape and then taking drastic measures to prevent that. But those drastic measures have such a strong impact on the local communities that they end up taking alternative routes that have an even worse impact on something else. So I think that's a, a very interesting point. And I think it's really something essential to all scientists, early or not early career, to just keep in mind that multidisciplinarity is the key to successful policy and just overall changes to the world. I need to echo everything Con said, like, that's a really brilliant way of putting it. I mean, not that long ago, we were calling it interdisciplinarity and now it's transdisciplinarity. And I think that's brilliant because it's really bringing together not just two different perspectives, not just three, but as many as you can possibly find, getting together as many different opinions, as many different perspectives and all that in one place is, is really, really what we need going forward. Thank you so much for having me. And if I could say anything, I would say the Galway conference was just such a brilliant experience. I was afraid that I wouldn't know anything. I wouldn't know what I was talking about because I'm coming from obviously a social science, political science background. Um, my knowledge on the hard science side of things could really be improved. <laughs> Despite that, it was such a welcoming environment and I never felt out of place for a moment. It was all in my head. So it was it was a really, a really wonderful experience. I think that kind of environment, if we can replicate that and as much as possible, that's the best thing we can do. Thank you so much for having me again. I kind of echo some of the points that the others made is uh, talk to people who are outside of your direct circle about some of these topics wherever it might be relevant. If you're in the marine sector, don't just stay within your GIS cluster. Don't just stay within your stakeholder engagement. Don't just stay within your marine biology. When it comes to like trying to, especially for advocacy, get these people all together, bring them into the same room, make it, as the other said, transdisciplinary. These problems are not going to be solved by one field or another. They're much more complex than that. Some of the fields like environmental, any form of activism or politics or anything in like messaging you hear, it can be in a very weird way focused in on itself. So people only talk about certain topics. People only talk about a hurricane when it hits the coast, but people don't pay as much attention to oh, where did this hurricane form? So in the case of Ireland, for example, Hurricane Ophelia or ex-Hurricane Ophelia once it, hit the, once it hit our coast. It formed in a part of the ocean that might look slightly weird to some people, but if you understand how the process of hurricane formation works, it was exceptional in how it formed and where it went. It defied most trends for, for a lot of, sort of storm events like that especially in this part of the Atlantic. So in that case, you need to not only engage people who are dealing with impact assessments when the hurricane hit, but deal with climatologists who will be able to tell you, okay, this storm formed like this and it might keep forming that way and it might become this strength. So here's how we can help you better prepare your emergency response teams. Here's how we can better engage with communities to help them prepare, something like that. It may appeal to, <laughs> to engage with people outside of your own wheelhouse, I guess. Thank you, Marianne, for inviting me to this today. It was, it was really, really cool. It was. It was very cool. Thank you very much, all of you, for inspiring us. This was a fantastic conversation. <laughs> I'm very, very glad. I invite our listeners to look for the other episodes of the Intergenerational Dialogues and also the episodes of the first season of the All Atlantic Talks podcast. They are available on YouTube, Spotify, or at allatlanticocean.org. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I will see you soon and that's it for today. Bye.